Brian Dean, welcome to Build to Sell Radio. Hey, thanks for having me, John. Tell me the Backlinko story. How does this begin? So it started when I had got into my first online business and realized that I knew how to create a product, which was relatively easy. I just didn't know how to get traffic to the site. I didn't know how to get people to hear about what I, I had just created, which at this time was an ebook. So I researched how to get traffic like any newbie. And I came across this thing called SEO, search engine optimization. And it was like, you can rank in Google for free and you can get traffic and customers all day long by just posting content. So when I went down this whole rabbit hole, I learned about this dark art called Black Hat SEO, which was like gaming the system. And I did all that stuff and got absolutely annihilated from one of uh, Google's updates. And a few months after that, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go legit. I am going to create, I'm going to do everything by the book. As Google says, it should be done. So I created great content. I did everything the right way. And I started to do well with my, the next site that I built. And when I went to learn more about this whole white hat SEO world that I didn't know anything about, there was really nothing helpful out there. It was all very vague advice, like create great content or, and build relationships with people in your industry. But it wasn't actionable in terms of what do you actually do to rank in Google the right way. So I created Backlinko as sort of the resource I wanted to learn more about this type of SEO. Okay. So I want to, I want to just ask two questions. You mentioned something called black hat and white hat. I have no idea what those are. Could you just give me a 30 second on each to describe them? Sure. So black hat SEO is essentially trying to reverse engineer Google's algorithm and game the system. So Google looks for signals of sites and, and pages that are quality. And you can either create quality stuff or you can create signals that look like quality, but aren't actually quality. And I that's... See. Sometimes it's a little bit easier if you find a loophole. So that's essentially black SEO. White hat SEO is doing everything by the book. Got it. Okay. And Backlinko, if I understand, was an educational service. Like, what was the business model? The business model was online courses. So we had the blog and YouTube channel that uh, brought people in, built the email list, and then sold courses. And those courses, were they in perpetuity, like a subscription base? Or was that like, you buy the course, do it, and like you pay once kind of thing? Like what was the billing model? It was actually a mix of both. It was either you could pay once or because they're, the higher tiers were a little bit expensive, they, they're about 6K, then you could do 12 installments. So it was sort of a, not really a subscription, but an, an installment plan. So this is an education. And so you're doing the content, you're creating the content in these courses and then marketing them through you know, the top of funnel stuff like your blog and your, yep. your videos. Exactly. What did you find to be uh, the conversion rates of say a blog subscriber to someone who buys a course? Like what would, what would that conversion rate look like? Oh, it was like tiny, tiny. I, I wasn't that concerned with conversion rate. I was more concerned about just how many people were buying the course and you know, how much we could do in a single launch. So our model was not to sell the courses all the time. We only sold them three times a year. And so those launch weeks were huge for, you know, that's, we made money for literally like 12 days of the entire year. The rest was just providing value essentially. So I wasn't as concerned with the conversion rate because from my first launch, I realized there's few people that are going to convert from reading a blog post, even if they're on the email list for a while and have the budget, have the interest to buy a course that's two, three, four, five, six thousand dollars. But if you can, for example, double your pricing, which is what we did one of the launches, I was petrified to do it. Our conversion rate went down, but the amount that we made from the launch was much higher. So it's probably something like 0.001% or something along those lines. But those people that bought, especially with the higher tier, they drove the vast majority of the revenue. Got it. Okay. Were you following, there's, there's a, a book and a, and a following called Product Launch Formula. Were you following that ethos, or that, that idea? Yeah, kind of. It was similar, but that by the time I started getting really into it, that was a little bit played out. And people were numb to this three video series thing that, that everyone was doing. So I dipped my toes in that just as it was like going out of style. So I ended up just going to more of a simplify launch, which was the same model where you get people sort of excited, you provide some value, you provide a framework. And then if they want more of the specific steps, that's where the course comes in. But I ended up just doing it via email. And that worked a lot better than 
the three-part video series or anything complicated with webinars. I tried everything when it came to launches. And this, the thing that worked the best were just text-based emails. Yeah. How did you sell something that's effectively free on the internet? <laughs> the sense that, you know, if somebody really wants to discover the art of white hat SEO, presumably there's a lot of stuff on YouTube. There's a lot of stuff out there where if someone was really industrious, resourceful, they could probably find it for free. Did kind of, did you think about that? And, and how did you sort of overcome that? It, that's absolutely a legitimate concern with any course, but especially one in marketing where there's so much free stuff out there. And my whole approach that worked uh, the best was I'm, pro I'm providing you steps. You can find information everywhere, but you're not going to find steps. So if you want to go out there and dig through everything, sift through the, the, the wheat from the chaff, and then create a plan for yourself, by all means, do it. That's what I did when I was starting out. But if you want to just get handed a step-by-step -step blueprint that works right now and just follow the steps and you're good, then you can buy this course. So when presented with those two options, some people actually opt for the free um, option, which is fine. But some people that were busy or wanted to scale up um, faster, they would go with the course option. So I didn't try to compete directly with the information by saying my information's better because I always believe in that mantra, different is better than better. So instead of trying to compete with the information, say, this is a totally different thing. This is steps, a blueprint, a course, steps you can follow to get to an end result, um, as opposed to general information. Got it. And, and, and to what degree did you feel like what you were offering was indeed worth what you were charging? Let me, let me come clean. What I've observed among some internet marketers and some course marketers is that they spend a lot of time on the funnel and the you know and and trying to figure out what the optimal copy is that's going to get the maximum click rate on but the product itself is is less uh their focus it's it's all the kind of marketing funnel stuff and it, and I've talked to lots of these guys so i guess and i'm, I'm not I'm not trying to be disparaging towards them because I realize sales and marketing is an important part of building a business. But at the same time, I, I wonder if for you, were you in that camp of like, I spend 90% of my time focused on the, the marketing of the product and 10% of the product? Or did you feel like the product itself was, was that good? Like, did, did, Am I making any sense here in this question? Yeah, absolutely. Because I've been through most of those courses and they're mostly trash, to be honest. Yeah. And that was one of the motivations for me to create something different. Now, to be clear, my first course was terrible. Um, I tried to make it good. I just didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to make something good. So it's a skill in and of itself to create a course that's really valuable. You need to you know, take pe meet people where they are, but also guide them along the steps. And people are at different places and they have different businesses. Some are on e-commerce. So in, in my case, creating this course, especially our flagship course, it was really an, an iterate, iterate process. We went, I went from, you know, the first course, which was me in my living room with my buddy filming me. I had a, I rented a flip chart and I wrote scribble on it. It was as ghetto as you could imagine. And the, by the time I finished, we had, you know, I was went to a professional studio where they filmed TV shows and it was like production value. And we had worksheets and PDFs and you know, people would, you know, ask the same question over and over again in 2.0. So in 3.0, we make a whole video about that. So, you know, help people along who got stuck at a certain point. So to answer your question, I put a ton of effort into the course, partly because I think it's good business in general, and partly because I had taken a lot of those marketing courses that were just fluff. And there was a lot of backend stuff. That was another thing I was, I never wanted to do and never did, never had upsells, never had a back end. It was like, this is the course you paid a lot of money for. I want that to be valuable enough. We don't have coaching or any uh, sort of nonsense on the back end. But in terms of charging for it, I mean, it took a long time to get to our highest tier to be 6,000. And a lot of it was my own blocks from being afraid of charging that much and thinking, how can the, no one's going to buy it? And is it worth it? Like you have the, it's almost a feeling of guilt. Um, so if I could start over, I probably would have, would have charged a lot more to begin with. But then again, the course wasn't nearly as good. I would say it got five to 10x better from the first edition to uh, our final version. 
And and how much more did the price move? Did it go up five to ten x over that yeah. duration as yes. well, or roughly? Yeah. So it kind of moved yeah. up in 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 lockstep with the quality of what you were offering. Yeah, I would say maybe the pricing went up five x and the quality went ten x. How hard was it to stay up on the Google algorithm? Because you talk to SEO guys, and it's like every every six months there's a new tweak or a new version, and 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 I'm assuming a lot of the content in the course would become obsolete if they make some giant change. Did did was it was it a challenge to keep up with Google in, in terms of how they were changing the algorithm? Not really, because the changes that they made typically just rewarded the stuff that I was doing. Ah, and okay. it wasn't one of those, okay, we're going to do this little gaming the system. And then six months later, Google finds out about it and it changes. That's what I was doing in the old days. Then I realized if you are creating awesome content, you're getting people to link to your website, you're building a brand that people search for, these signals that Google looks for, that's only going to get stronger as they get better because that's what they want. Um, it's really beginning with the end in mind. And I thought, if you give Google what it wants, it's usually going to reward you for it. So my whole SEO approach was that. And that's what I taught in the course. Now, that's just not to say there weren't changes and updates and things, but it wasn't as fast moving as a lot of SEO people make it sound. Like I would say you could take the same course from the 1.0, which was 10, almost 10 years ago. And a lot of it would still apply today. Yeah. Um, so would, it was a little bit of a challenge though, just in general for little things change, but the, the vast majority was the same. Okay, I want to get into the sale of Backlinko uh, uh, in a moment, but I'd be remiss because I'm sure there are a lot of people listening saying, I didn't tune in today for tips on SEO, but now we've got one of the world's experts <laughs> on the line. I'd love to hear a couple of tips. So, you know, if you're a business owner, you have a car dealership, you have a dental practice, you have a marketing agency, and you're like, Brian, if I could do one thing today to improve my SEO rankings, what one thing would you have them focus on? The number one thing is I would look for keywords that people are searching for that you may not already be going after. If you're a dentist, you know, you're probably already targeting dentist Colorado, you know, dentist Boulder, but there are a world of keywords that people search for that are more specific. And if you can create landing pages around those that meet the user's needs, it gives them what they want. Um, even though not a lot of people are searching for them, they can bring in customers. So a lot of people, when they look for keywords, it's called keyword research, they'll scoff at a keyword that gets you know 10 searches a month or something. But if that's a customer that's searching for what you sell, that can be really valuable. And for example, with, with my current business, we target keywords that get like 10, 20 searches a month because they're exactly the customer. You know, They're looking for like trend software or something. Not many people are searching for that, but the people that are, are a perfect customer. So we're happy to get in front of them. Interesting. So that's the thing I, I would recommend to start with. Okay. So it's sort of super niche down, build out yep. content by sort of the long tail keywords. Super helpful. And thanks. And I, let's go back to the regular schedule program, which is about <laughs> your, uh, your business, its growth, and ultimately its sales. So, so you're building these courses. You've got the studio uh, at the end. Uh, talk to me about your team. Did, did you have full-time employees? What, what was that like? No, they're all contractors. Um, and so how did you have them structured? Like what were they doing? What, what, what did you have people doing? So our main person that helped was a customer support person. That was our one quasi full-time person that also doubled as an assistant <clears throat> and did a bunch of other things. She was kind of like in that book, um, the E-Myth. He warns you not to have this person on your staff. This like, but you need that person when you're just starting out because you don't have systems yet. So that person was sort of the main did invoicing. You know, if someone uh, in, a contractor needed an invoice paid or needed to schedule a podcast interview or something, and then I had a developer that helped me with the content side, build all you know, build everything, make sure our blog, our blog had a bunch of custom features at the end, all this cool stuff that that helped um, the content stand out and the course stand out. And then we had more or less an editor that was making sure screenshots looked really good in the blog post, would do the slides and animations for the videos. And we had a few other, you know, random people, but it was a pretty small team at the end, I would say, maybe four people working uh, part time in me. And how big did you get this company before you decided that you wanted to sell it, like in terms of revenue or? Yeah, our best year was about 2 million a year. 2 million. Yep. In in revenue, in top line revenue. Yeah, yeah. 
Got it. And, and you're a one man band with seven contractors, right? Like you're no full time employees, nope. but you've got a team of of part time and contractors. It's a lot of money. <laughs> For it was good margins, I'll tell you that. Because the course and also that what we were selling, we weren't selling widgets. The course was relatively cheap. Now it was expensive, like up front, because you the studio, the video editors, this and that. You know, it costs like tens of thousands. But it the unit you sell one, uh, you can sell it forever. And because I, we were doing content that was a little bit more evergreen, we didn't have to roll out these six month updates. We could do an, you know, a new version every two years, which was great because we'd actually give that new version to all customers for free. Again, I didn't want to be one of those shady gurus who'd be like, oh, now there's a 2.0, you can buy this one. It was like, your grandfather in for life. And it also was great marketing because that's the number one question we got when we launched the course. Does this still work in today's environment? Is this still going to work today? Is this still going to work today? So we were like, we got a new version for you, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. And it was a lot of work to create those, but those popped, those launches did way better than saying, you know, here's the second time we're launching this 3.0 version. Got it. So by communicating that things were updating and that it was a new, yeah. uh, a new course. And of the 2 million, um, like how profitable, like how, how much were you able to pull out of the business a year on the two? Um, I mean, probably all, all in, like with every expense, maybe like 1.2 in profit. Wow. Okay. So this is like a 60% profit margin company. Like this yeah. is wildly profitable. Really amazing. And, and so I'd be curious to know, did you, were you, like, when did you first cotton on to the idea of maybe selling the company? I never crossed my mind, really, in, in any serious way until it happened. I really didn't, because I didn't think it was a very attractive business to buy. When you think of businesses that people buy, it's usually not these one-man show businesses because you're the key man, right? Like, it's your thing. And the whole brand was like me. I was writing all the newsletters and, and I was writing all the content. I was doing all the courses. like. You know, and you can't really, as much as you can buy, you know, you can't buy someone's, you can buy someone's time to a certain extent, but you can't buy their whole like essence and their likeness and stuff like that. So I never really thought about it. I mean, I've got a couple, I've got a few acquisition kind of feelers over the years, but maybe it was a confidence issue. I was like, why would they want to buy this business? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Only after did I realize, oh, actually I had a pretty good asset here to sell, but I didn't realize it at the time. So what happened? They reached out to me. Um, they yeah. being SEMrush. Correct. Which uh, is, uh, t describe what they do and who they are. They're an SEO software company. So they're basically a platform to help you get high rankings in Google. They'll help you find keywords. They can help you optimize your website and do all sorts of stuff related to SEO and, paper, and other, other forms of, of digital marketing. How did they reach out to you? Well, they emailed me out of the blue with a vague email saying, hey, you know, We'd love to partner with you sometime. Let me know what you think. And I just ignored it because I get tons of those emails. And I was like, nah, I don't want to do some partnership. As I've done those in the past, and a lot of times it's like, we want you to promote our thing. It's like some influencer marketing thing. I'm like, I don't, I'm not interested in doing that. Um, and then they followed up like two weeks later, like, we're interested in buying your company. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's a different story. Now I might be, you know, pique my interest a little bit. So um, they just literally emailed me out of the blue. Now, I had a little bit of kind of a quasi relationship with the company. I had been a customer for like 10 years. I had done a couple of webinars for them, but the person that contacted me from the company, I had never met. So I think it was more, they were looking at the, as they told me later, they looked at the landscape of their market and realized we could compete with this site or we could just buy it. And that's, that's sort of where their higher level decision of how they got interested came from. Do you remember the title of the person who reached out to you? Um, he was like ex he was like a VP, VP of marketing, so right below the CMO. Interesting. But Semrush, like how big a company is it? Like how many employees? A uh, thousand. I mean, they're publicly traded. Oh, so we're, okay. Big. I did not. I didn't know they were that big. It shows you yeah. what I know. Okay. So this is this is a big company reaching out saying we're interested in buying you, and. That piqued your curiosity, it sounds like. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, for sure. I was ready. To, I, I, to be clear, I, I wasn't married to the business. I had already started another business and I was wondering what to do with this one. It was a manna from heaven, honestly, because I was thinking, <laughs> should I wind this thing down? 
I, I'm sick of doing courses. I'm sick of being in front of the camera. Like I was ready to sell emotionally. I just thought practically no one would want this thing. So it wasn't a matter of, wow, oh, I can't sell my baby. Like I was ready to do it, especially because I had this other business, which was doing great and had a tiger by the tail. So I was like, man, I really want to sell this thing. But I, you know, I didn't thought silly. When I got this message, I was instantly interested. I was like, oh, oh, definitely. I want to sell. So it didn't take a ton of arm twisting. Although, of course, I played it up on the first phone call. Yeah, you know, I would think about it, actually. I would consider maybe selling. You know, looking back, I don't know if that made a difference. Like if I was going to sell this, you know, my new company, I don't know if like this kind of stuff makes any difference. Like these people that are buying companies, they're smart, they're sharp, they have a number, they know that how you act on a call is not going to make a difference unless you're a total jerk. But to be uh, clear, you, you kind of were a little standoffish, a little like cool to the idea, even though inside you're like, man, this is, this <laughs> exactly. is amazing. Exactly. Really cool. And Just so trying to where's it go? a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Understandable. So where does it go from there? So, so uh, the VP reached out with an email. What happens next? So then I said, okay, sure. Let's talk. And I remember he emailed me. This is a follow-up email on the Friday. And I had the meeting on the Monday and all weekend, I was super stressed. Like how much would I sell this for? Are they really, really going to buy it? Because they literally sent the email, like we're interested in buying. So I had to think, oh my God, what would the deal structure look like? What about the team? I'm thinking, are they going to bring them on? Like, what are they going to do? Because your mind goes a mile a minute um, when, when this process just gets off the ground. So What's then we the had number you had in your mind on the weekend? I wanted to do 5 million because you I wanted figured- to be. You, you thought that's, that was your number. You wanted it. That was my number. Get. And, and I, what, what was it about that? That like, how did you get to that number? It was basically three and a half or four X the year before. So the mm-hmm. year before we had sort of a down year. Cause I wasn't, it was COVID and we weren't doing as many launches and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I figured that was a good number, completely arbitrary. Um, to, to be I, clear, I, three and a half to four revenue, multiple. Of yeah. Revenue. T- it's, I was just doing top line. Okay, um, got it. Because the profit margins are so good, it's not that big. I mean, of course, EBITDA matters, but it's not something they were really focused on. Got it. Okay, so you had five in your mind on the weekend. And what happened next? Monday morning comes around? So we have a call um, with a guy I didn't know, never met before, and just chatted for a while. And then he was like, yeah, we're interested in maybe buying um, Backlinko. We've looked at the, like, the landscape of how people find us and how people find software like us. And a lot of them go through a site like Backlinko first and they trust in, you know, this website. And we also could, you know, use a nice asset that gets a bunch of traffic and their, their sort of marketing philosophy at the time was, you know, if we buy this asset, not only will we rank in Google for the keywords that we buy the asset for, but for those we already rank for, now we have two spots we control. So for SEO tools, for example, they can have a spot, then they control this other property that they can, you know, tweak to their name. So if I'm recommending tool X, they can change it to SEMrush um, subtly. But over time, that Google juice sort of fades and, and, and atrophies. Like what did they, like how were they going to keep that fresh uh, given that you were going to walk away and not do the courses anymore? I, I don't think they had a real detailed plan. I think they just wanted it. And then they would sort of figure out the rest later. So, and actually there was the potential, and this is something they've done recently, to actually do better without me because they can staff up. Um, right now they have a whole staff writing and optimizing and doing stuff on it. And it's actually performing better than ever. So I think that maybe they thought to do that. Um, but I don't, they didn't tell me like the whole master plan. They just said, basically, this is their rationale for wanting it in the first place was the audience and also the email list um, and the traffic. So then they could sort of get this traffic and maybe send some of it to SEMrush either directly or just for branding. You know, if someone's reading about SEO tools, maybe SEMrush is fifth on the list because it's just an arbitrary number, put it number one. And on that first phone call on Monday, did, did they ask you what you wanted for it? Yeah. We basically had a, a handshake agreement on that first call. <laughs> You're kidding. No. Really? Yeah. There, I mean, it was also the ZERP, like, that, you know, everyone's buying everything era. So there was, I mean, it was literally like, what do you want for? I was like, well, 
I was thinking five million. That was my, I just said what I wanted. And they're like, okay, we'll get back to you. We need to, you know, look at some things. So um, they basically said, it sounds okay. Now it wasn't a firm offer or a letter of intent or anything, but it was just a handshake offer on the first call, which I was stunned because they didn't look at my numbers. They didn't look at anything. It was literally just, okay. So I think they maybe had a higher number. Now that looking back, they probably had a higher number of mine. They're like, we should take this <laughs> before he changes his mind or wises up. Yeah, um, got it. Okay, so the 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 five million number that you mentioned was before they'd even seen your top line revenue. No, I just told them what it was. Okay, so you're on the yeah. phone. You're like, we're doing yeah. Best I'm sharing numbers, but it's not like a due diligence process. Or yeah, anything. yeah. And then the got next it. thing that happened after that was they wanted to fly me out to Boston to their headquarters to meet everybody. How'd that go? So, yeah, it was good actually, but I was super nervous for two reasons. One, it's just a, a little bit of a ner- nerve wracking process. Um, and also I thought the deal was going to get done while I was there. I had no idea how this thing, how selling a business went. So when I went there, I had, they, I think they had sent me an LOI, a letter of intent before leaving, but I thought we we're going to sign the deal there. So the night before I'm in my hotel room like scrambling to find a, an M&A lawyer to help because I'm like, we're going to sign the deal like old school, like on a piece of paper. I was so naive. So I get there and they're asking me for all this stuff. Like, okay, we need a list of your contractors that you've worked with. We need your actual, like more detailed revenue numbers. We need your, your analytics for your traffic. And, and then they got more into the details, but I was physically there. But then I kind of realized, okay, we're probably not going to sign the deal. It was basically just a meet and greet. So I met the guy, the, the vice president of marketing there, who was the sort of the deal guy, and then also the CEO. And we went out to lunch and we chatted and stuff. So I think it was more of a sizing me up um, than really you know, anything about the numbers, because you can get those over email. So we spent like the first couple of hours just doing the numbers. And then after that, it was more hanging out, discussing and figuring out how we could you know, how to, what, what I would do if they bought the site and how, you know, we could grow it. Got it. And, and just to be clear on the LOI letter of intent, uh, do you happen to recall you got this in your hotel room? Did, did they require you to sign it yes. before you met in Boston? Yes. Okay. So you had signed that and, and so you, and then you, you, you met in Boston and it was, it was sounded like a fairly, like a, a lot of, diligence questions kind of in the, in the yep. weeds of the, you know, yep. conversion numbers and contract exactly. relationship and so forth. Okay. What was the CEO like? What was lunch like? Uh, he was cool. I mean, it was uh, celebratory. Like we're go- like the deal was seemed to be done. I mean, we went out to lunch and we we're talking already in the tense of the deal happening, you know, it was one of those, okay, when this happens and when I was like, I'm sitting there like freaking out, this is really going to happen. Like, Oh my God. Um, and then later we went out to dinner and we're all drinking vodka at legal seafoods, like cheer deals. Like, Oh, this is in Russia. Cause they're, um, all Russian guys. Here's how we're, here's how we celebrate deals in Russia. So I'm drinking vodka and I don't drink that much. I was completely hammered. (laughs) <laughs> and thinking this is really happening now it did the deal took three months after that this is how naive i was but the deal it seemed consummated sort of at that time i would have had been stunned if the deal didn't go through because it felt like i had sort of a handshake deal from the whole executive team sealed by vodka and it was going to happen um, and i thought it would happen in like a week but it ended up taking a lot longer than that I want to get into that before we do the the letter of intent. Did what was um, the role that you were going to play in the letter of intent? Were they proposing like an earnout or equity role or like what was they, how were they going to tie you in to staying? It was essentially a consulting role because I, they wanted me to come on full time, but I had it I had it out that I had this other business that was that I was growing. So I said I can't I can't really do that. Um, so. I was able to basically have a legitimate excuse, like a, almost like a doctor's note. Like I can't, be, I would love to come on full time, but I just can't. I have this other thing going on. So they were pretty cool with that. Um, I think it was only 20 hours a week for a year. 
And then it had a chance for renewal and we did renew because it worked out. It was good for everybody. So I renewed again um, on, a, on, a, on a much, much smaller basis. Um, so it wasn't really like I would be CEO. I'd really be handing the reins over to them and I would be available for whatever they needed, whether it was related to Backlinko or not. Like, for example, one of the tasks they had me do was start a podcast. So I started a podcast like <laughs> randomly for them and started interviewing guests just like you're doing now, John. So I was sort of just at their disposal for a year. That's basically what my role was. And the number they put on the LOI, did they give, they, they offer you the five that you were yes. expecting? So you had five plus a consulting agreement that, that would have you do various tasks. Was one of the tasks that they tried to paper a, a revision of the course, like a new course effectively? No. Or, no. Okay. Got it. So you get this LOI, you got your magic number, <laughs> you're thinking <laughs> the deal's done over vodka. It sounds like there's a story here because it took three months. So what was the next three months like? Well, this story isn't as interesting, but there is a story. I mean, it was essentially just a really drawn out due diligence process, partly because this was their one of their first acquisitions. So they didn't have like an, on, like an in staff, in-house staff that had specialized in these. So they brought a bunch of um, attorneys from outside the company to do the deal. And they were like maybe had different priorities in terms of pushing it done than in-house did. So part of it was also my fault that I didn't, I wasn't ready for this. I didn't have anything ready. And for example, they asked, okay, first thing we need, like I had mentioned, all the contractors you ever worked with. And I was like, that's going to be like impossible. I've been running this business for nine years. I'm an Upwork junkie. I'm on there all day long. I've hired <laughs> random people to do one thing, to create like a thumbnail once. How am I going to find that person and get them? Oh, not only list, but get them to sign like a waiver oh, that says, you know, you're not liable for blah, blah, blah. So the, the contractor list in Excel was like 150 people. And I had to message every single one of them, including people that burned me. There are a couple of people that I paid advan an advance to that ghosted me and I still had to swallow my pride and email them and said, will you sign this thing? One of them did. I came out of the woodwork and did. So, and I wasn't ready with like numbers and anything they needed. So everything they asked me for, it took me a little bit longer than it could have because I wasn't ready to sell. If I was going on like one of these platforms where you can sell your business, I would have all my ducks in a row because I would have been ready. I wasn't ready. But it was also the due diligence was really extensive because they're publicly traded. So they have to, and acquisition is one of those things that you can have like shareholder lawsuits and liability, but they were most concerned with contractors. They were really worried someone's going to come out of the woodwork and say, hey, you, you know, Brian hired me to do this thing and I wrote this thing for the site and now I, I should own that. I, that's my IP. And they were afraid someone, people were going to come out and say, you know, I worked on this design and, you know, I didn't have proper contract that said Backlinko owns that I own that IP. Now, fortunately, by using platforms like Upwork and 99 Designs, you're automatically protected with that stuff. This is something I learned from this process because in the contract, it says whatever they deliver, you own. Mm -hmm. But if you just hire people off the street and you don't have that agreement in place, they could potentially say, look, I made that for him, but I, I still own it. Um, so now when we hire contractors, we make sure to have this standard form that basically says anything created during this time for the, the business is owned by the business. Um, but it was a lot of like phone calls and legal stuff. Now, fortunately, I, I found a lawyer on Upwork that was amazing, that helped me through the process. And I remember the first call we had with the lawyer when I got back from this trip, they, they're going, we're going to have our legal team, which is like a bunch of ninja lawyers at this public company. And you got to, you should bring your attorney. So I hired this guy in Upwork. I have no idea if he's even going to show up because half the people in Upwork are flaky. So I'm on this call petrified that I'm going to be like, here's me with my lawyer. And, you know, he doesn't even show up. Fortunately, he showed up and he was like a pit bull on the first call. The first call, he was like, this thing, you know, you need to change this. You need to change that. He was, he was like super aggressive. I'm glad he was, had my back, but he was a little adversarial. So after the call, I was like, Jeff, like, chill out, man. Like this deal is pretty much done. <laughs> we don't need to, this isn't like a lawsuit. <laughs> All right, we're on the same side here. So once he realized that, then he was great because he has tons of experience with M&A. And that's why he was so aggressive because he realized I was outgunned and he didn't want something in the deal, especially non-compete wise, 
to come back to bite me down the road. So he ended up being super like the MVP of this whole process because he helped me navigate it all. And also I would have signed something that would have been, you know, maybe detrimental in the future for me. And he helped me avoid those roadblocks. What was the biggest thing he helped you avoid? Like, I'm sure there were dozens of examples of things, but if you could put your finger on one, you know, landmine you almost stepped on and, and he showed you how to avoid that landmine, what was it? The number one was liability. So in the agreement, it had some, maybe this was the contractor agreement that was tied to the deal. I don't remember, but it was essentially, you know, if I did something bad, I'd be liable for that. So with a public company, the potential damage is huge, right? So if I said something or did something that, you know, cost millions, I could be liable for that amount of money. And it's silly because I'm an independent contractor for like 20 hours a week. What could I possibly do to damage the company that much? So he was able to remove that. Now, it's one of those things where it's like very unlikely that this would ever come up, but it's just good not to have it in there. That's just bad business to have something in there that this sort of Damocles hanging over your head that if you make a mistake, you know, say, say for example, I'm sending an email to this email list that they bought. They're like, Brian, send an email. And I, you know, put something wrong in there and it causes a bunch of chaos. Like, Instead of just being like, Brian, you're fired, it could be you're also liable for all this damage and we're going to determine it and all this stuff. So that was the number one thing because when you are in this, when I was in this situation and the deal was in front of me, I was just grabbing the pen. I just wanted to sign it. And he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. like, you know, we got time to go through and make sure everything's good before we do that. Yeah. 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 Well, it's a, it's, it's a, it's great to have a great lawyer in your back pocket because, uh, Because there's a lot of stuff that needs to get done the right way, for sure. The ultimate deal, I think we were talking about offline. I think uh, Semrush announced that at at four million plus a uh, a consulting agreement. So, how did they raise the specter of the the deal going from five to four? Like, I'd be curious to know, like, when that happened and and how how that sort of went down. Well, it ended up the deal was five it got announced as four because it, that was just the cash up front. Ah, the rest okay. of it was dripped out. So that was just something they put in one of their filings because they had this huge significant expense. So they had to say what that was. So there wasn't a, uh, uh, a dilution of the actual value. It was just structured slightly differently than, than you anticipated. Exactly. So you got your number, which is incredible uh, yeah. g- given... Given it's good and bad. Like it's good because they accepted, but then you're like, I'm a sucker because I obviously could have asked for more uh, if considering they accepted so quickly. So at this point, I've, I've made peace with it. I'm happy with everything. It worked out amazingly. But you know, obviously, considering how um, easy it was with zero negotiation, I was like, man, maybe I should have asked for more. Yeah, interesting. It's it's um it's one of the most common things we hear of reasons owners regret their exit is at some point after the, you know, elation of the deal getting done, there's a sort of a natural sort of, uh, uh, ebb and, and sometimes people have a moment of, ref- of self-reflection and think, Oh, maybe, maybe I could have done it differently or I could have gotten more or whatever. And it's a very common, um, I think side effect of selling a company. I am super grateful for you sharing the story. I had some some uh, lightning round questions that I wanted to ask you. Are you up for a, a quick lightning round? Sure. All right, let's do this. So what was the, the most questionable, some might say slimy thing that SEMrush did during the process of buying your company? And maybe, maybe the answer is they didn't do anything, but was there anything that, that was like, oh man, that's, uh, I wish I'd known about that tactic or that ploy? No, they're totally above board. I mean, honestly, like I, I, I wouldn't have an issue sharing if something happened, but the things that they put in the contract, for example, the liability, that's to protect them. That's not really doing anything shady. That wasn't a gotcha clause. It was just something that they probably had in some standard contract that they put in there. No, yeah. the only thing they could have done better is say, you only want 5 million, like we'll give you more. Other than that, they were totally above board. And and I think we've already probably touched on it, but the biggest mistake you made in the process of selling, like if you could rewind, is it sort of naming your number in the beginning or was there something? Uh, yeah, I probably would have named a higher, a higher number because worst case scenario, I, because I think 
I was afraid of them saying no, not realizing that that's super unlikely. No matter what number you throw out there, they're going to come down to whatever number they're comfortable with. So you don't have a lot. It's almost like old school negotiating at the farmer's market. Like you don't have a lot to lose by going a little higher and then maybe you can meet somewhere in the middle. So I probably would have had my number and then asked for a little bit more. And worst case scenario, you go, you go back to your number. Yeah. I've heard selling companies is like kind of an emotional roller coaster. It's a the recurring theme we've heard on the show. Um, I'd be curious to know what was, what was the, the ebb for you, like the lowest point that you reached emotionally in, in this process? And then also what was the highest point? The ebb was definitely somewhere during this long due diligence process where it's, you know, it's the holidays, it's December. And I'm like, because I live in uh, Portugal. So there's time zone differences and they're scheduling all these things at like 5 p.m. Boston time, which is like 10 p.m. here. So I'm staying up to do these calls with lawyers and they're just asking me stuff or we go on a call, you know, schedule it. And I rearrange my whole life around this call. And then they're like, oh, what was this call about again? You know, it's one meeting in their whole day. It's like insignificant to them. And I'm like, oh my God. And just, oh, okay. Well, and a lot of like, you know, okay, I think we only need a couple more things and we're almost done. And then I send them those things. Ah, actually a couple more things. So it was a little bit of like a carrot in front of me where I was just sending them stuff, sending them stuff. I'm like, there's nothing else to know. There's nothing else to know. Like you want my, like outside of a colonoscopy result, there's nothing else you could see <laughs> that I could share. Like I, you have everything. So that was definitely the ebb where it was like getting dark early. And I was like, I was stressed because even though the deal was sort of seemed done, you never know. You know, one day they come back to us. Well, the board, you know, didn't said change your mind or the, the stock market, you know, the stock goes down and we can't do it or whatever. Like who knows? Or we found another opportunity until the deal is actually signed and the money's in your account. You don't know. So it was a little bit stressful and ha carrying that stress for months, the ebb was when it just continued. I mean, I had like, I was so stressed about this. I was um, clenching my jaw when I sleep, but it never did before. And then as soon as the deal was done, it, st it stopped. I was cured. Hmm. It was carrying a lot of stress of this, like, maybe it's not going to happen. Looking back now, if I could do it again, it doesn't, it's not helpful to be stressed. It's, you know, it's going to happen or it's not. Um, so that was the ebb was this constant, long, stressful process that was a little bit stressful, but it was, a, it was a little bit stressful for such a long time. The duration that, of it. That was yeah. The duration of it really, really caught up with me. Yeah. 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 Did you ever, uh, you know, stomp your feet or slam your, you know, proverbial hand on the desk and say, kind of enough is enough and, and, and go to the the VP or the CEO and say like, you know, if you guys can't make a decision here, I'm out. At the end, it wasn't that strong. I didn't have the guts for that, but my lawyer was definitely pushing at the end and it helped. It made a difference because the, you know, you have to look at incentives. Like I want the deal done. The senior vice president wants the deal done. The lawyers, they do want the deal done so they can say we did it, but they want to, you know, really uncover every rock, you know, cross every T, dot every I. So their incentive is to be extra, super, super duper careful. And those don't, incentives don't really align. So it was a, that was one of the things we just had to push the lawyers, like kind of, can you give us a list of like everything you need? Because otherwise they were just dripping it out, like I mentioned. We need this, we need this. So at the end, we're like, can you just, for the whole deal, if you just give us a list of everything you need, we can get it prepared for you right now, and then we can close. And at the end, every message, every meeting, my lawyer was like, okay, hope we're ready to close next week. Hope we're ready to close next time. And I think it put a little pressure in a good way um, on everybody. Yeah. It sounds like kind of pushing a string, like uh, <laughs> there's no tension <laughs> in it, but you're, it's really uh, interesting to hear you describe the, the, the competing incentives because you're absolutely right. Lawyers are incentivized to protect you and to make sure yeah. that nothing goes wrong. Uh, which is not the same as you or the other side, which is great. What about the high? What was? Do you remember where you were when the deal finally got done? Like, what was? What was the high for you? Uh, yeah, I, would say, I mean, the deal got done on Christmas Eve. That's how late it was. It was wow. like last minute. It was basically now or next year because it, it had been pushed off so many times. This closing date, the high was definitely the day it was announced, and I remember them telling me. I mean, this is really embarrassing, but. They told me on the day of they're going to announce it. Like the deal was done, money was in the account. Great day. 
obviously. It's done. It was more of a sigh of relief than celebrating. It was a little bit of both. But this, the best day was the day it was announced. Um, and I remember they told me, okay, we're going to announce it at 5.30 p.m. Eastern on such and such a day. And I remember thinking, man, I got to stay up late again for these people. Like I'm an early to bed, early to rise kind of guy. So I was like, I asked them, is there a way we could do the announcement at like 2 p.m.? instead and they said well actually because we're publicly traded we have to make announcements after the market closes and i was <laughs> huge <laughs> face palm moment i mean i was so embarrassed to ask that um but anyway they made the announcement stayed up late it was great and I, the 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 announcement day was the best because you just get overwhelmed with positivity and it's a day where people come out of everywhere to say how they how you help them because with a business like this it's not personal. Like I didn't work with people. I wasn't a consultant. I wasn't an agency. So I didn't know anybody that was buying the course, but I helped them in some way. So they all came out from and saying, you helped me, or even from the YouTube videos or the blog. And then friends and family, of course, texting congratulations. Cause I couldn't really share this was this process. It was super top secret NDAs, as you can imagine. So it was like one day, all of a sudden the floodgates open and it was just an overwhelmed feeling of gratitude for the people that helped me for the support that I had along the way. Um, and just the feeling of, I felt like I was busy building this alone, but I realized after this announcement that there were a lot of people with me along the way. That's such a cool feeling. And like, what are like, it sounds like a, a sea of, you know, wave coming in of, of, uh, of adulation, which must have felt incredible. Um, as you prepared for an exit, you're obviously pretty handy with Google. <laughs> what resources did you kind of tap into to educate yourself about this process of, of selling a company? Um, I mean, Google was the number one at first because they said, they're like, we're going to send you a letter of intent. And I had to, I was like, okay, Google, letter of intent. I had no idea what that was. <laughs> right. Um, so anything, I mean, from nothing. So one thing that helped me was there was a, a YouTube playlist by the guy who started MicroAcquire which is now acquire.com. And it's sort of like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, so Andrew has a resource on like getting your startup ready um, to sell. And it's sort of the things that I should have done if I was starting. I was already halfway through the process when I found this course, but it helps you with things like due diligence and what to expect and what a letter of intent is and how the process usually goes and how to be a good seller. Um, and you know, there's a difference between being like, oh, I want to sell my company and putting it on a platform like acquire.com versus he showed some examples of people that say, okay, they have a whole timeline of how it's going to work. Like week one, we're going to do, you know, receive some preliminary offers and have calls. Week two, we're going to start negotiating. Week three, we want final offers in. Week four, we're going to do due diligence. Like that's how you want to be because it's good for you because you're dictating the terms and it's good for everybody because they know the process, how everything's going to go. So that would be a resource if you're interested in selling that I would recommend checking out. That's a great suggestion. And we'll put that in the show notes of BuiltToSell.com. And folks uh, can also uh, listen to Andrew Gazeki because we interviewed him about the, the sale of his company before he started Acquire.com. Oh, cool. He sold a company and we, we interviewed him about, about that. So, But a great resource and thank you for sharing it. I was not aware that that uh, YouTube series existed. Um, that's great. What did you buy yourself? What's the trophy that you bought to commemorate this crazy win? Uh, I took a trip with my family to Miami. And we did like an all expenses paid trip, stayed at the W, got massages, tennis lessons. Um, I really wanted to celebrate it with people because I'm like a monk. I, I don't want anything. I live in the same place that I lived when I, before I sold. <laughs> like I don't, I haven't upgraded anything. I bought a Steam Deck which is like a kind of like a Game Boy. I bought this. It's, it's called like a, a Steam Deck? Steam Deck, yeah. Shows you what I know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you really like, splurge, let's put it that way. Just kind of kept it in the bank for the most part. Nice. And, and who did you take to the W? When you say your family, like is this your extended family, your mom and dad? Yeah, no, no, just my, my like immediate family. Like oh, dad nice. and mom sort of thing. That's awesome. What a great way to celebrate. I'm super happy. That, uh, that you did that. And so now what's, you, you alluded a couple times to Exploding Topics. This is a new company. Maybe just give 30 seconds on sort of what Exploding Topics is all about. So Exploding Topics is a platform that identifies trends before they go mainstream. 
So we scan platforms like TikTok and Instagram and podcasts and discover trends using an algorithm and machine learning before they become mainstream and you've heard about them. And I actually started this company before I had sold back Linko, which is one of the reasons I was like sort of ready to, to move on. So cool. And so companies that have a vested interest in like kind of understanding consumer trends would subscribe for access to your data. Is that how the Exactly. Our customers are like Unilever, Netflix, Shopify. So um, whoever, cool. Yeah, we have a good customer list because those are the companies that really want to know what's coming next and they can really jump on a trend. It's, it's huge for them being six months early. Absolutely. So that's called Exploding Topics. Uh, and we'll put Brian's uh, website in the show notes of Built to Sell. Uh, Brian, if people want to reach out to you, is there a social media platform you prefer? Are you like a LinkedIn guy or more of a... Uh, yeah, guy? let's do LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Brian okay. Dean on LinkedIn. Yeah. All right. We'll put uh, Brian's LinkedIn profile in the show notes at builttosell.com. Brian, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, John. 